This lesson covers linking group policy objects and how they're actually applied. It's easy to create a new group policy object and link it to a domain or OU or even site straight away. I can just right click and say create a GPO in this domain and link it here. I can do the same thing at an organizational unit level. But if the group policy object already exists, for example here, I can link it to a location. I can right click Justice League and say link an existing group policy object and it will then let me select the group policy object I wish to link. A single group policy object can be linked to multiple different OUs, even domains and sites. When an object is linked, for example at this domain level, my drive map, you have control over exactly what is enforced in that link. So for example, I can see the link is enabled, but I can also say enforced. If I set a group policy object to enforced, what this now means is the settings defined in this group policy object cannot be overridden by another group policy object. The same setting may be applied multiple times. Likewise, a link can be enabled or not enabled. Within the group policy objects themselves, you can actually configure it to disable, for example, the user configuration part. I want to optimize my group policy objects. So if I know I'm not setting any user configurations, then I should disable those. It avoids them even trying to be processed. Since I can link group policy objects at different levels, there has to be an order in which they're applied. And it's always the closest to the object, i.e. closest to the user or the computer is applied last, i.e. it takes precedence. A machine has a local policy that is applied first, i.e. the least preference. Any group policy objects linked at the site level are applied next. So if a setting is applied at the site level, it can override settings applied in the local policy. Next settings linked for group policy objects at the domain are applied. So domain settings can override those set at a site, which override those set locally. Lastly, settings applied in organizational units are applied. So organizational unit settings would override those set at the domain which override those at the site, which override those set locally. Since organizational units can be embedded, group policy objects at the furthest site are applied first and then work their way inwards. So the last group policy objects to be applied are the OU the object actually sits in, so therefore takes precedence, which is what you would want to happen. I may, for example, have a setting applied at the domain level, but I might have something more specific for a certain set of users or computers for their OU, so I would want that to override the general domain policy. There are exceptions to this. Maybe I'm the domain admin and I want a setting to be applied no matter what, and maybe I've delegated group policy settings for a particular organizational unit to that organizational unit's admins, but I don't want them to be able to override my setting. This is where I set it to enforced. Now, even if that setting is applied at an organizational unit level, it can't override these group policy objects I've set as enforced. This is fairly dangerous to do. It can make it very confusing to ascertain what policies are being applied and why. Likewise, at an organizational unit level or even a domain, I can actually say block inheritance. What this does is any group policy object set above, i.e. in the least precedence, would now no longer be applied. With this set, None of these other group policy objects set at the domain or the site level would be applied to this organizational unit or any of the objects within, unless those group policy objects had been set to be enforced, in which case enforce overrides block inheritance. As you can see, this can start to get very confusing very quickly, which is why wherever possible, avoid the use of the block inheritance and the no override or enforce. Likewise, as previously discussed, it's actually possible to set security filtering, i.e. even though this policy has been defined at domain level, it's actually only going to get applied to this machine because it's the only one that has access. Normally, all authenticated users, which includes computers, will access the group policy objects. For this one, that was removed, so they can't do the list, they can't do the apply, which means only this one machine can actually use it. Another example is that WMI filtering. I have a script that I like to run that sets the background for all my servers. It runs as this internal utility that gives me information about the machine, the memory, and some details. 
but I don't want that to apply to my desktops. I created a WMI filter and applied it to this group policy object link here. This filter is running a select from the operating system via WMI and the product type has to be two or three, i.e. a server. Again, this does add complexity, but I can now do exactly what I want through my group policy objects. The other consideration for the application is what if I have multiple link group policy objects at one level that override the same setting? This is where the link order comes into play and I can modify this order to control who has precedence over the other group policy objects so I can here control the order of importance at a single level. One thing that may be confusing about this list is you would think the item number one is applied first and therefore has the least preference. So one is applied, then two, then three, then four. That's actually not the case. This is actually showing you the precedence. So the link that is number one has the highest precedence, i.e. is actually applied last. So number 12 in this example is applied first, then 11, 10, 9, 8, all the way through to one. So that controls how these are actually applied. So you can make sure you get the result you want from the group policy application. To summarize, we have local policy apply first, then site policies, then domain, and then OUs in the order that is most specific to where the object actually applies. No override means even an object configured closer to the object I on an OU cannot be overridden. And block inheritance set on a container, i.e. an OU or a domain, stops those objects linked to the parent from being applied unless any of those objects at the parent have the no override or enforced setting. Remember that no override takes precedence over block inheritance. And if no override is set at multiple levels, in this case, the first no override that was configured takes precedence. So if I had a setting at domain level set to no override, and I had a setting applied at an organizational unit, the same one set to no override, the policies in the domain level one would win. Again, it gets very complicated very quickly, so try and minimize the use of these no override, i.e. enforced and block inheritance, the WMI filters, the security filtering. It will really make the management that much harder.